And so I think it's the perfect opportunity to move to the panel discussion with all speakers of this session. And um, of course, there's the possibility to ask questions to each other. But maybe we start with summarizing for those who maybe are late or just joined for the panel discussion, quick for the, ta uh, for the take home message um, uh, from each of your talks, just to remind everybody what your talk was about and then maybe start in a discussion with questions from the audience, but maybe we have lots of new technologies in there, so you must have questions to each other. Um, but we, I would say we start with Eric, quick again your take home message from your talk and then Francesca, John and Shetan and Ravi. Eric, I can go uh, first, Stefan. So, uh, yeah, uh, like so I think, uh, yeah, and I, and I commented on the variable uh, shifts technology, and it's the take home message really is that there is a this paradigm change to have a variable scan speed may help us in different clinical diagnoses or clinical settings. And the differing speed has may have different advantages. We still need to work out exactly which patients for which scan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Eric, you want to be next or Francesca, who wants to be first? Eric, are you? Ladies, ladies first. Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> French gentleman. Uh, yeah. So I suppose take a message would be a, a technology that is disruptive uh, in trying to identify sick and uh, stressed and dying cells in the eye that can be used as a biomarker as well as hopefully in the future as a diagnostic. Excellent. Now, Eric, next to summarize your talk, please. Yeah, the take home message is that uh, every uh, hyperreflective lesion, even in exudate in um, neovascular condition, is not an active lesion. So um, clinically, we are basic. We have to identify and analyze all these cases and to be aware that some of the cysts are degenerative. That there are some dome shapes, so you have to move the line to find the dome shape, et cetera, et cetera. And to know all these conditions in which hyperreflective, it's mainly for the uh, junior and the resident and the young fellow, every uh, hyperreflective lesion is not an exudative lesion. It can be transudative or others. Very good. And Shetan and Ravi, can you... Um... Uh, summarize again. I mean, it was very yeah. clear, but for those who probably now yeah. need another one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very, very simply put, um, I don't think you can seriously practice uh, in pediatric retina without OCT. I often get asked if I had a certain pot of money, where would I, where, where would I currently spend it? Now, I don't have any commercial interest in Heidelberg, but given the fact that Flex uh, has multimodal imaging capability. I currently would put my money into Flex in comparison to other devices because it gives you other opportunities for diagnosis and surgical management uh, for pediatrics. And, Very good. And, and, I, I think, and I think the, the, well, the other thing that I would stress is that if you do invest in Flex, please invest in somebody like Ravi, talk to him, because you do need to know the tricks of the trade to avoid frustration. You do, you do need to invest some time talking to somebody like him uh, and, and we'd be well, very happy to have people attend and come, come and spend some time with us because you do need to know how to use it to not to get too frustrated. Not easy. CK, that might become a very expensive statement now. Probably now all the UK pediatric clinics will hunt Ravi from now on. So good luck in keeping... So good luck. a lot of money. <laughs> so I see already the glow in Francesca's eyes. So uh, be prepared for that and Ravi make the best out of it, okay? <laughs> I, always, I always have a glow in my eyes. Hi, CK. <laughs> Hi, Francesca. Good to see you. Are there questions uh, to each other before we come to questions to the audience? So I suppose, um, I mean, that was very interesting regarding the fact that hyper-reflective um, lesions can, can mean so much. Um, the characteristics that you went through were, were really interesting. But as a prognostic, how would you how would you go about um, grading those? 
Uh, that's that's actually supposed to be, I think, only <laughs> for Eric. <laughs> that's Eric. supposed to be for Eric. Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> Can you? Can you repeat? So the question was yeah. um, for yeah. for the differential diagnosis. Uh, Francesca, can you repeat your question, please? The question was on hyperreflective foci and also looking at the different types of lesions that he went through very nicely. Is there an easy way of looking at it as a prognostic um, analysis sign? Yeah, it's a good question. So the. Um, um, Hyperreflective lesion is a panel, is a patchwork of many different conditions. So I, there is no global answer for all of them. In which each condition, there is a specific uh, phenotype, a specific disorder, and uh, uh, it, there is no global answer to the, this question. It depends on the condition of the disorder, of the disease. So if you were talking about prognostic for let's say GA or dry AMD, so you are confining yourself to that, um, those diseases, mm -hmm. would you, would, and so you narrowed it down. Any, okay, any for example, for GA, there is no correlation between the degenerative cyst and the prognosis. For uh, ghost drusen, there is. There is clearly a correlation. For uh, outer retinal tubulation, if we take by, one by one, or in outer retinal tubulation, it's frequently associated with fibrosis, very advanced form of uh, exudative AMD. Um, what else? For the stable uh, fluid in exudative AMD, it's usually correlated with a good prognosis on the opposite because it's stable. There is no increase of fluid. There is no major exudative features. So in each of these conditions, we have different prognosis according to the phenotype. Thank you. Thank you very much. And while you're thinking about other questions, I take one from the audience, and this is related to CK and Ravi. Uh, first of all, uh, excellent work. Uh, act, by the way, there's another fan of you, Francesca, saying, nice to see you, Dr. Cordero. I don't know who it is, but it's obviously a fan. But back to, uh, to CK. CK, uh, which one Heidelberg modality has changed your imaging approach in pediatric ophthalmology? So is this a, is, say that question again, which... You mentioned that it's a multimodal yeah. imaging device. Yeah. That's what yeah. you mentioned. But is there one yes. modality that has changed your imaging approach in pediatric ophthalmology, one particular? That's, I think, the question. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I, I guess what I, I, I would say uh, for, 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 for uh, autofluorescence imaging, if, if, I, if I look at the surgical management of disc pit maculopathy, for example, uh, in children, uh, one of the problems is uh, a vast array of surgical techniques um, and also uh, preventing recurrence. Um, and I've started using autofluorescence imaging to document how I'm able to um, separate the optic nerve head pit from the fovea. So we, we apply peripapillary laser uh, and then post-operatively in clinic, we do autofluorescence imaging to map out whether we've been successful in completely isolating the nerve head from the fovea. Quite often you'll apply the laser and you think that you've got it all, but when you do the autofluorescence imaging, you, you, you will find um, potential gaps where the fluid can uh, re-migrate across. Uh, now, I don't, that's a hypothesis. Uh, and, you know, it's a rare condition. So we're, we're looking at our data, but that's one way in how my clinical management of dyspid maculopathy has changed as an example. But, but I think probably if I was to give you another example, Coates disease, the management of Coates disease and using fluorescent angiography, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be with spectral spectralis. I mean, uh, using RETCAM, it's been shown that image-guided management reduces the, the number of anesthetics you have to give a child. Um, but I, we, we found that the quality of spectralis and geography is way superior to what RECAM can give you simply because of the laser, uh, laser technology that, that we use. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one more question for Francesca. Um, we go back to the 30 and 5. 
And you mentioned as well counting manually versus the CNN, uh, the convolutional neural network. Um, just a practical question, is that then fully automatic or you still have to do something manual for the network? No, it's fully automatic. Um, and certainly that's what we've used. We used it after glaucoma for the uh, AMD, the geographic atrophy, um, just to show that it was. Um, the idea is as we get more and more data though, I think uh, we're go it's going to get even more intelligent. So one of the issues that I'm keen that it does is look at the spatial distribution as also cell morphology. I think the cell morphology is gonna be key because it's gonna give us a hint as to which disease um, and which stage of disease we're talking about. And the last question of the session uh, is for John actually, and it is somehow related to, er to Eric's presentation. And the question to John is, now having a little bit experience with different shifts, which shift or which gear would you apply in order to identify uh, non-exudative um, lesions? Oh, yeah. the time. T time is probably the best uh, way to identify the non exudative because it doesn't move with time. Yeah, okay. any, any device, uh, whatever the, the device, the fact that it does not change with time is a good point. Yeah. And John, which shift would you take? Which, which speed would you recommend? Is it fast? Uh, probably, the, <laughs> probably the 125, I think, seems to be kind of good down the middle right now. Uh, but I think we need to do some more work with it. Okay, that's a, a nice wrap up. So we can combine everything we acquire at different speeds, the non exudative, we move on with dark biomarkers. And if children are involved, definitely uh, give Ravi a call. I think that's the take home message today. And I thank, <laughs> I thank everybody for this very nice panel discussion. We go in the break. And if you want, I'll be back in 30 minutes. Thank you for, for uh, being with us.